with our next speaker, Leiji Gafour. Leiji is a self-taught entrepreneur and experienced company operator who made his start creating opportunities at the age of 14. And he's been working, leading, and building businesses ever since. So Leiji is the former co-founder and CEO of Future Fields, a Y Combinator backed biotechnology company and one of the first operating cellular agriculture companies in Canada. He has over 15 years of experience, both public and private enterprise, executing strategy, technology, and product development for everything from financial institutions, manufacturing, uh, public health, uh, to world-class universities. And he's a founding member of the Cellular Agriculture of Canada. And so thank you very much, Leiji. And uh, now we're going to continue to stop slaughtering sacred cows, I think, is the theme of the day. <laughs> Awesome, thank you. Good to meet you all. Uh, question I always like to start with, especially for new audiences, how many people are familiar with the term cellular agriculture or cultured meat? Okay, so mostly new. All right, um, so a bit about what I do and myself. So I work for a company called, called Food Science. We're based out of Canada. Uh, and we focus on what we call cell-based foods. So what the heck is that? I will get into it deeper, uh, but the short version is instead of killing a cow, you take a cell sample from its muscle tissue and you grow the meat from there in a controlled system entirely. Uh, and we also do precision fermentation as well. Uh, so that involves taking something like yeast or E. coli, uh, doing a manipulation on it, and having it produce things like casein or whey, uh, so you don't need to get it from normal dairy production. Uh, I actually grew up on a farm in southern Alberta in Canada, uh, had my hands in the dirt, so to speak. Uh, and uh, it was around the time in Canada where you stopped really being able to have a effective farm if you didn't make something that wasn't covered by subsidies. Uh, so eventually that was sold. Uh, I got really into computers, uh, and I never imagined I would get back into food in such a long, roundabout way. Um, and at Call Food Science, for a bit of an overview, uh, we are a global company that operates uh, across 19 properties, a lot of continents, uh, and uh, uh, we have a pretty wide reach in the industry. Uh, but one thing when I'm talking about this, especially to a new audience that might not be familiar, is highlighting that this actually exists. So a lot of the time when people f first hear this, like, oh, how are we going to make milk out of E. coli? Sounds kind of crazy. Um, but all these photos that you're seeing here uh, are real in just the last half year. So on the left is a fish ball laxa from a company in Singapore. Uh, the next one is a cut of chicken from a company in South Africa. Uh, the next one is a, a cut of fish for sushi, so a company working on tuna, salmon, white fish. Uh, and the last one is actually from a company here in this region uh, called Perlita Foods, uh, working on mollusk and other types of seafood. Uh, there are actually two companies in this region, uh, Biomilk with a Q, being another one working on replicating human breast milk for infant formula replacement as well. But it is a lot more than that. Uh, just quickly glossing over, if there is something that is a commodity or something that is produced using an animal process, there is in general one to two companies a month globally that are starting up uh, creating a new technology to cover it. Uh, some other items I like to highlight are uh, coffee, uh, honey, uh, collagen, uh, every basically land-based meat, including crazy stuff like lion, uh, which you generally can't get uh, opening up new culinary opportunities uh, to be able to really uh, disconnect food production uh, from the land. Rather, that's the dream. Uh, but I tend to be a very cynical person, which is what I will spend a lot of this presentation about. So the big thing is cellular agriculture. Is it actually 
better. You'll hear it by different terms. Uh, usually people find out about it through the term lab-grown meat, cultivated meat, cultured meat, uh, cultured seafood. But at the end of it, it's all about using cells uh, to make uh, food. A couple of caveats I will add is that if you are a cell biologist or a bioprocess engineer, I'm definitely glossing over a few things uh, to get through this in a more general sense. So if you want to yell at me afterwards, that's okay. We can talk afterwards. Uh, and a lot of the data on this is very new or just entirely absent, uh, which I will get into as well. And if you ask me about policy questions, I'm Canadian, so I won't know. So I'd redirect you to the gentleman who presented first uh, to answer any of those questions, or uh, Dr. Sylvia Secchi as well to uh, answer those. So how does this work? And I'll run through each of these, but at a high level, there are four steps. You collect some cells, you feed the cells with some sort of input, you use bioreactors, many different kinds to scale up your meat and then you pull it out uh, and there's many different products that come out of that but a uh, key part is collecting those primary cells uh, so i will start there to get into the claims that the industry likes to make so by let's say taking a cell sample from a cow a muscle sample uh, you begin to reduce the need for how many animals you need. So some companies in current state uh, are going as far as to actually have a small farm of their own with their own select cattle that they can just continually take a muscle biopsy from uh, as needed. Uh, so there's a theoretical limit on how many times you can use cells, but for a lot of these companies, they're currently focused on being able to create as much meat from as few animals as possible in the smallest physical footprint as possible. So there are implications with that. Uh, a big one being that uh, there's much less waste introduced into the environment if you're able to make thousands and thousands and thousands of kilograms of meat uh, from a few cell samples uh, over time. And I will come back to that later on. And theoretically, uh, on that same end, it also lowers the amount of fertilizer or could have added manure as well uh, needed in the total production chain. I say theoretically, which I will come back to because uh, the inputs will be really critical on determining how effective that actually is for this industry in reducing its environmental impact in reality versus the claims that are currently being made. Another aspect is recycling unused nutrients in the process. Uh, so one example of a technology that many companies are working on right now, current state, is as they're adding things like water into their system, because it's done in a closed manner, uh, is being able to pull out their necessary nutrients that they need back into their production processes and trying to design closed loop systems from the start. Those currently, of course, do not exist yet, uh, but I can say with high confidence that there are multiple companies that are working on it. So getting into the important part for this audience is the input. So usually you'll hear this term uh, growth media, but you can think of it as what you need to feed your cells. Uh, so the cells are still living, uh, and you need to give them what they would normally need in a living body, but without that body to get it to them. Uh, so one part of that is creating inputs from multiple sources. Uh, and you can get these potential nutrient sources from agricultural waste streams. What these tend to look like are basic elements like glucose, uh, including things like phosphorus and nitrogen, folic acid, uh, salts, inorganic salts, amino acids. There's a big long list uh, and a lot of it is unexplored and a lot of it currently comes from the medical industry. Uh, so a lot of the people that I work with actually were generally either in pharmacology or drug development, uh, which is where growth media is generally used as inputs into the system. 
and with providing this input uh, in a controlled manner, is scaling and production in these systems is theoretically controllable. So it happens entirely in bioreactors. So instead of needing to create a, uh, a, a giant farm with many animals that takes years to grow, uh, companies are currently working on how to be able to scale down production as their demands decrease as well, uh, so there's less waste. But when I first started this presentation, my big dream was to be able to take this big long list of not even a full list of inputs and match it against of how does this work with regular agriculture with feed, for example. Uh, but I can tell you that it currently does not exist. Uh, and that I spent a number of months trying to look back and forth across these two lists of how do I actually compare inputs for animal farming versus this list of inorganic salts. Uh, so if anyone is interested in having tens of thousands of people read a research paper and is willing to take this on, uh, it is a huge opportunity uh, to do that right now for the industry. But on that note, it is still very hard to do a really deep life cycle analysis uh, for these cultured products. Uh, part of that is the origin of the industry itself. Uh, it is interestingly out of sync, uh, the business itself, with current uh, academic options even uh, for this industry. So the University of Tufts recently got a grant to focus on cellular agriculture. Uh, there are none yet in Canada, uh, but there are huge gaps between what the industry is working on versus what is understood. And part of that is the effect of uh, venture capital uh, into this, really keeping a lot of the information as IP, even simple stuff like that might affect uh, environmental outcomes is potentially treated as a marketing or competitive advantage that can make it very difficult to be able to know the truth of, is this industry doing the right thing or not? Uh, sourcing for inputs is all over the place uh, for what you need to feed your cells. Uh, I was talking with a producer in China for amino acids, uh, sell it for pennies on the ton, uh, but now that landscape is changing and no one is quite sure where it'll come from. And like many other new industries, when you solve one bottleneck, the bottleneck just shifts to a next thing up the chain. Uh, so individuals are either uh, multi-vendor sourcing for things like amino acids, glucose, even where they get their water from, uh, or they're trying to make new technologies on their own. And with that is a risk of creating new constraints for high volume production of this for things like amino acids, glucose, and other inputs, is if there is an advantage for using something like uh, corn, for example, if a lot of the inputs can be derived from that, uh, then it may not be able to have the positive impact on that aspect uh, of the environment uh, that is currently being claimed. And getting to the last stage, bioreactors. Uh, so bioreactors, if anyone is not familiar with it, uh, like big beer brewing tanks, in this case, there's many different designs, whether it uses an impeller or not, hollow fiber, totally novel designs that treat them as fully replaceable modular systems at a small scale. And it looks more like a server room uh, than it actually does a standard uh, 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 industrial facility. And that with this being done in a closed system, it is entirely possible and generally necessary uh, to do it under controlled conditions uh, and with lower use of antibiotics. Because if you screw that up, uh, you lose your entire production run. So one interesting aspect of this industry is that if you make a mistake and you introduce contaminations or pollutants, uh, you just lose all your money on that run. So there is a bit of self-reinforcing for needing to control uh, uh, risks of things like zoonotic diseases and so on, uh, just given the nature of how the industry uh, operates in a fully controlled system. Uh, and another argument, if you look this up, is about energy use. One thing that is really important is how these companies design their pilot plants and how they scale up, and even where they are. 
uh, and then a lot of the impacts for uh, energy use in the environment and these types of practices uh, depends on that design and what is available to them. Uh, so one thing that is constantly noted is that if a plant is, let's say, using coal-based power, uh, that it will still have a massive negative impact uh, based off of that. Uh, but to sum this all up, the big dream of the industry ultimately is being able to start to decouple agricultural practices from the land and water uh, by forcing it into a controlled system by design. Is it easy? Uh, no, it's definitely not. Uh, the first burger that gets popularly talked about uh, made by a gentleman named Dr. Mark Post. It was done in 2013. It cost nearly $300,000 to make a single burger. Uh, but I can tell you today, uh, going back to that first picture, uh, that companies are already close to $10 or below. And that only took uh, about a decade, which is quite long on human terms, but ultimately is actually pretty quick uh, when it comes to the potential impacts that this may have. Um, and each company has its own cost parity challenge uh, and assessment on how they will impact the environment. Uh, in that, if a company is working on bluefin tuna, for example, uh, they are much, much closer to cost parity already than, let's say, chicken, uh, which is already quite cheap. The first company that I started on with this uh, almost seven years ago, we were making chicken using these techniques and we were successful. We can make 300 gram chicken nuggets uh, only at the cost of $3,000 per pound, which wasn't very good in Canada and Alberta at the time because the cost per pound was $1.34 for normal chicken. Uh, so I worked on that for five years and the story has changed quite a bit. Currently, no, there's pilot plants that exist. If you're fortunate enough to be able to travel to California, for example, uh, you can go eat chicken or seafood uh, right now. Uh, Wild Type is one company that's working on salmon, where if you're polite and you send them an email, uh, if you happen to go into San Francisco, they will gladly let you try a sample. Uh, and I do know that the two companies in this region are going to be operating out uh, opportunities uh, to be able to sample their products as well. Uh, Perlita here is going to have a tasting very soon. So keep an eye out and you'll be able to soon have a chance to try it for yourself. Uh, and one last interesting note is that this does directly compete with other agricultural subsidies and supports. Uh, I'm actually not quite sure whether that is good or bad yet. Uh, I think it could actually be good uh, but at the same time, there is a risk with any new high potential industry. And what I'm seeing on the uh, uh, investment side is a lot of the same very large firms uh, that operate here in the United States, I'm trying not to name anyone, and in Canada uh, are taking heavy interest in this industry. So the risk of that really high consolidation still exists uh, from the same groups that operate the CAFOs right now. Uh, when all the startups in the industry, their goal and their stated goal is often to be able to destroy CAFOs uh, very directly. It is in many of their pitches. Uh, so that risk still exists. Uh, but to sum all this up is that this is real. Uh, and the companies are moving from what was once thought impossible uh, towards the inevitable. And to be very specific, uh, I can say with 90% confidence that you will see a product release here in the United States of a land-based animal product within the next two to three years with general public availability uh, made using these techniques. Uh, and that this is a huge opportunity to start to introduce uh, systemic changes at the start with something that might hopefully be able to start to disconnect uh, agricultural and food practices uh, from the land. That, take any questions. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Should have raised the mic up. Um, let me try to put it in a, 
context, I might understand as comparable. What you're feeding cells is essentially blood plasma. Is that is that the case? Originally, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It was that originally. So FBS, fetal bovine serum, was originally what was used. But uh, because of just how the origins of the industry are in terms of animal rights, uh, there is a huge push to totally decouple it away from blood plasma sources or anything that's actually animal-derived feed. Uh, so there's been a push towards animal-free uh, solutions uh, to be able to cut out that blood plasma aspect. So would a good cost comparable be still be blood plasma as as is it more expensive than blood plasma now it it's interesting because that that is the exact question that comes up with every investor that like i want to invest in this new thing that's what they ask about is the blood plasma or fbs uh and right now the food is actually cheaper than fbs especially high quality fbs so fetal bovine serum uh there's huge variability in what you get out of the blood uh, of a living animal, and the cost per liter average for that um, was around $300 per liter last year for the blood plasma equivalent. But companies are getting down to do towards a dollar per liter now uh, by removing that blood aspect out of it. Uh, so it used to be much closer, uh, but now uh, that, that part has been removed and the cost parity is about 100 times less by ignoring the blood aspect. So um, your recipe site didn't list a phosphate source. Where does the P come from? That is a good question. <laughs> and that, honestly, um, part of the challenge with this right now, and when this opportunity to present first came forward, the first thought I had was, oh, I'm just going to ask all the companies that I manage. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, living in the world of NDAs and venture capitalists, is that a lot of the information was still locked up. Uh, so I'm treating that more as an opportunity is that we could select good sources for that to come from versus where companies are sourcing it right now from just the lowest cost denominator. Uh, so the real answer is at the moment, uh, I don't know, or companies aren't disclosing it. Uh, so there's an opportunity there. Uh, I think at the moment it's, it just comes together with the uh, growth media. Um, the phosphorus that, that is in the growth media. And, and in that context, I wanted to ask if you have a, an idea how many liters of uh, growth media is required to um, have a one kilogram of, uh, of meat. I, I guess it's different for every type, but uh, and do you have a number? Yes, it, I have a great research project for you, if you're interested. Uh, yeah, but you hit the nail on the head there, is that everyone asks, so how much do we actually need to produce, let's say, a pound of meat? It used to be really high. It used to be in the hundreds of liters per pound. But there has been so much work done on asking the question of, do we actually need this full list from like FBS, for example, to actually grow the cells? It was a question that was never asked before. Uh, and companies have reduced the ratio that is needed substantially. Um, so it's it's not getting it's not close to one liter per one pound. It's definitely still much higher than that. But the challenge is, yeah, uh, bluefin tuna cells, massively different demands than like beef cells. So right now it's all over the place and there's nowhere that that's actually collated together at the moment. Question: uh, Does any one specific uh, alternate food product uh, derive more phosphorus from waste out of your bioreactors? And if so, or in general, how does that compare to, let's say, conventional dairy farming nutrient losses? Yeah, 
honest answer on that again is I don't know. Going back to that big list of inputs versus like, I really wanted to be able to compare it uh, to feed is that is actually still an open question, um, which is part of the reason why I took this opportunity to talk uh, because no one in the industry yet was talking about phosphorus, nitrogen, focus was on carbon uh, as everything is. So at the moment that uh, question remains to be answered. Um, while the number of meat processors is small, is there a concern that if cellular meat is, success is successful, a single company could form a monopoly or pseudo monopoly on all aspects of meat production? I mean, I am concerned about that. It is theoretically possible on the business side. I know specific people that are actively trying to do that on the investment side, quite legitimately. It's a, it's a venture capitalist dream to own everything all at once. Uh, which is not necessarily the best thing. Um, at the same time, uh, there's been a lot of discussion within the industry that uh, depending as this grows up, uh, that it, the, it creates room for uh, more traditional farming practices at a small scale, because we do not see this new technology replacing everything whatsoever. Uh, humans like what they like uh, and there will be definite room uh, for other sources and types and I would honestly be happy if we could get to close to 10% of production in the near term because it would still have a positive effect uh, but the chances are there'll still be uh, multiple sources of production. What is the consumer perception on cellular meat? It depends where you live which is very interesting. Uh, with the companies that we have in the APAC region, for example, there's very, very, very high acceptance, uh, especially for particular seafood types uh, where culinary and cultural practices are generally different. Uh, there's different levels of knowledge and what it means to create food uh, from the land varies depending on where you live. And their, uh, uh, the reception is quite high. Uh, interestingly, growing up in what some people refer to as the Texas of the North uh, in Alberta, uh, that there's actually also quite a high acceptance there uh, with farmers asking me already if there's a way they can both have their cattle and also use bioreactors to replicate their family's meat source over the years. Um, and in general, uh, because companies are always concerned about that, there's been a huge focus on the food science aspect to make it as palatable and tasty as possible because no one wants to be the first company that comes to market where everyone says that they suck because that was the big thing with a lot of the original plant-based foods is they got more popular because people didn't like how they taste. Uh, so it still remains to be seen, uh, but what I've tasted so far personally, I'm pretty hopeful that there will be uh, high acceptance. Quick question. Um you know, I think about these sort of novel processes, I equate them to, you know, sort of the biopharma industry. I'd be curious if there's been any, you know, research into the byproducts or waste streams from these precision types of operations. Because usually, yes, they're smaller, but they're usually concentrated. I think about this from a receiving, you know, I work with a lot of public utilities, receiving uh, uh, receiver of that waste stream and how that actually has to be managed and treated uh, and returned to a surface water. Um, so I'd be curious if they've gotten to the point where I know most of them pilot scale, you know, looking at the waste stream, the characterization of that, and what it would take to actually treat that. Are we replacing, you know, one waste stream for another waste stream that has to be dealt with? Yeah, yeah. I am definitely generalizing a bit, but there are, uh, there is a company in Singapore and a company in Australia where it was really discovered that by addressing that waste stream part of it, uh, they can actually save money uh, as part of that carrot and stick kind of idea um, that the cells as they're growing them don't use 100% of what they input. Uh, and because cost of production and getting close to parity is such a focus that as the companies have made it past their funding to get to the bottom where they can build a pilot plant, 
that there's been enough diffusion of this knowledge now in the industry that, hey, we can actually save money and get our costs down further by paying attention to the waste as opposed to throwing it out because there's tons of useful material in there that they put back into their system uh, that they already track. Uh, so it is being thought about. If that remains to be the case, we'll have to find out as the industry scales.